My name is Bill McFarland. I have the pleasure of being one of the board members at Cure PSP. Uh, and my job for today will be to kind of transition us from one person to another to try and not like leave too many details out. Jacqueline will come fix it for me if I do. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Larry Golby. I'm going to have to read it and then I'm going to make a couple of personal comments. Dr. Golby is Emeritus Professor of Neurology at the Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School in New Brunswick. Graduated from Brown University and New York University School of Medicine. Completed residency training at New York University Bellevue before assuming his current position in 1983. 1983, and CurePSP had been diagnosed maybe 20 years in 1983 or identified as a separate syndrome. So, so Larry is absolutely a pioneer. His research is in the clinical genetics, clinometrics, and epidemiology of the Parkinsonian disorders. He devised the PSP rating scale, which since its publication in 2007, has become the standard clinical measure and treatment outcome marker for PSP worldwide. Now, in addition to that, Dr. Golby has been a part of Cure, Cure PSP since its, its founding or maybe a couple of years afterwards. He's a world-renowned expert in the, in the science of PSP itself. He knows so much, I told him, you can't tell us everything you know in 35 minutes because my brain's already full, uh, so there's not that much room. But he's been a wonderful advocate. We get some tough questions at Cure PSP sometimes. He is always he was always available when we get a question we can't answer. We'll call him and we'll get an answer, or he'll call patients and talk to them directly. He's a wonderful humanitarian, a really great guy, uh, and uh, Mr. Cure PSP, as far as I'm concerned. So, Larry, please come on up. Thank you, Bill, for that very nice introduction. Remember in the... Uh, what was that uh, spoof of a uh, James Bond movie where there's a, a Dr. Evil? And uh, I'm, I'm talking about how Bill just referred to me as Mr. PSP. And at one point, somebody addresses him as Mr. Evil. And he says, I didn't go to evil medical school for four years to be called Mr. Evil. <laughs> so um, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that it's morning when you're Mental acuity is at its greatest. This, this applies to myself as well. I'm not referring to PSP in particular. Uh, in order to uh, educate everybody about, not PSP in general, I'm also going to talk about cortical basal degeneration, CBD, and multiple system atrophy, MSA. Can't cover all those topics in this period of time, but I'm going to select just what it says on the screen. What's going to happen to me, and what can I do about it? And in the middle, I'll have a couple of slides about why it's happening to me. So we will proceed. First of all, you've heard that PSP is a tauopathy. Tau is a protein that accumulates in an abnormal way in the brain. Well, PSP is not the only tauopathy. Corticobasal degeneration is, and 26 other diseases are also tauopathies. And here's a pretty complete list. Notice uh, that there's um, Alzheimer's disease on the top left here. Is the cursor showing up over there as well? Yes. Uh, Alzheimer's disease up there. And uh, the other one that's in the headlines is chronic traumatic encephalopathy. That's the one that the football players get. And there are lots of others. Now, multiple system atrophy, in that one, it's a different protein. It's called alpha-synuclein. And there are other alpha-synucleinopathies. The most famous ones are Parkinson's disease and dementia with Lewy bodies. Now, how common are these diseases? They are, they're all orphan diseases. They're rare. Uh, how rare? Well, there have been various surveys, PSP, has been found to be about 5,000 people in the United States. That's one and a half per 100,000. That's just the ones who have a diagnosis already in their medical records. Uh, but if you take a small community where you can evaluate every person in that community who might possibly have PSP based on some early symptoms, something nonspecific like uh, memory problems or falling, uh, 
uh, if, you, if you cull that group for people that have PSP, then it comes to about five or six per 100,000. So that raises the number in the United States to close to 20,000. And then uh, there have been a couple of autopsy studies recently where they just take general autopsies of the general population and they look for early evidence of PSP in the brain tissue. And there they find about 5% of the population has that. It didn't cause PSP symptoms during life. Maybe it would never have caused it in a human lifetime. Or maybe if the person had lived to age 200, maybe it would never have caused it. We don't know. But uh, we do know that those early signs of PSP are there in the brain in 5% of the population, of the elderly population. Now, the, the prevalence of corticobasal is about 10% of PSP. That has not, not been formally uh, assessed on its own. It's just too rare. And multiple system atrophy is about 70, 80% of the prevalence of PSP. OK, now, the natural history. Natural history means what does the disease do of its own accord? How does it start? When does it start? Uh, for, for PSP, as you see here in the middle, this is the age on the bottom. The average age for it to start is about in the mid-60s. And this little bristle coming out is a, it's called a standard error of the mean. It's just a measure of the variability in the population. And um, for MSA, it's about the same duration. The end of the blue bar is the average age at death. And for both PSP and MSA, it's something like seven years. And that's, that's what we're dedicated to, is extending that. Now, for MSA, the duration of survival is about the same, but the onset age is almost 10 years younger, in the mid-50s. For Parkinson's, it starts in the late 50s. And thanks to levodopa, the survival is much longer. Uh, before there was levodopa in the 1960s, the survival in Parkinson's was a little, only a little bit more than PSP or MSA. It was about eight, maybe nine years on average. Clinical syndromes. Uh, in the past oh, uh, 15 years, there has been a lot of work in discovering subtypes of PSP. We used to think that it was a very uniform disease. In fact, I wrote that in textbook chapters, that it's, it's very unitary. It is not unitary. About half of the people with PSP have the classic kind that we were all thinking of and that was described back in 1963 by Steele, Richardson, and Olszewski. That's called Richardson syndrome because Dr. Richardson of those three guys was the, the senior guy who actually made the intellectual discovery. Uh, the others helped in important ways. And the, um, the, the most common of the so-called minority phenotypes is this PSP Parkinsonism which starts out looking a lot like Parkinson's disease and then gradually evolves into something looking more like Richardson syndrome as the years go by. That's about 30% of the PSP population. And then there's a type that looks a lot like corticobasal syndrome. And I have misdiagnosed myself people with corticobasal syndrome who turned out to have PSP, and the reverse, by the way. And that's a little less than 5%. The others are all down around uh, less than 1%, maybe 2% for pure, pure akinesia with gait freezing. Now, gait freezing can certainly be a symptom of any type of PSP. But when it's the main, the first and the worst symptom, that's, that's this type, pure akinesia with gait freezing. Uh, these others, uh, just very briefly, uh, postural instability is self-explanatory. The behavioral variant, frontal temporal dementia, this is where uh, there's an extreme degree of inhibition, social disinhibition um, in behavior, inappropriate talking to strangers, touching things. Uh, this is how the PSP can start in just a few cases, like 1%. Uh, there's another disease, much more common, called frontotemporal dementia, which does that all the time. That's a different disease. Uh, this other mouthful here, non-fluent variant primary progressive aphasia, mainly affects the, uh, the rhythm of speech and um, cerebellar ataxia means kind of a drunken appearing, appearing uh, loss of motor control. And progressive apraxia of speech, apraxia means loss of a practiced skill, like when a baby first learns to talk, they're putting together sounds and losing that, going back to that 
earlier stage of development is what apraxia means. Apraxia can affect many parts of the body, not just speech. All right, so what's the difference between Richardson syndrome and PSP Parkinsonism? The, these are the, the, the real differences. Um, the uh, PSP Parkinson's has a longer survival, about nine years as opposed to six years for PSP Richardson's. That seven year figure I told you for PSP in general averages the two together. Uh, so the, the age at death is later. The age at onset is about the same, but the age at death is later. The survival is longer. Uh, there's falls is a hallmark of regular PSP Richardson, the classic type. It's not as common in PSP Parkinsonism, certainly not early in the disease like it is with Richardson. There's less cognitive loss, less loss of ability to think in PSP Parkinsonism. There's more tremor, like in Parkinson's disease, hallmark of Parkinson's disease is tremor. Well, there's more tremor in PSP Parkinsonism. Uh, supranuclear gaze palsy, that's the trouble using the eyes to move mainly up and down. Happens in everybody with Richardson's and a majority, but certainly not everybody in PSP Parkinsonism. And other visual symptoms are also more common in Richardson's. Now, um, family history. A common, a common question that I get when I'm taking care of patients, and I've received it once today so far on, at curbside, is, is this hereditary? Is PSP hereditary? And the answer is basically no, but there is a kind of a hint that there is a, a tendency in that direction. It's not enough to make the child of somebody with PSP change their career plans, change their financial plans. Uh, it's just that there, if you look carefully enough, you can see a little bit of a tendency for it to occur in the families of people with PSP than in the families of people without PSP. So here is, there have been very few studies of this. Here's one, this asks about, if you ask about a family history of PSP in the people with PSP, you're basically not gonna get enough to have a study. There's not enough statistical power there because the disease is so rare. But if you widen your scope to include a family history of dementia or Parkinsonism in people with PSP or CBD and compare that with a family history of those things in healthy controls, then there's a difference. It's not quite statistically significant. It would have to be less than 0.05, this P value. But in other words, this has a 17% uh, chance of just being uh, a random finding, just a kind of a, uh, you know, like a flip of the coin. If you flip a coin four times, it might come out three heads and one tails. No one's going to be surprised at that. Uh, same thing here. This is, uh, it would need to be a one out of 20. In other words, 0 0.05 for scientists to consider it statistically significant. So it didn't reach that, but it is kind of suggestive. Now, here's a, a more precise kind of study, and this is really the only other study that bears on this. Here, some neurologists took healthy relatives of people with PSP, and they took some healthy controls, and they matched them for their uh, gender and for their age, and they gave all 46 people a test of uh, various things that, um, tests of movement, it was a tapping task um, and a test of emotion, a survey asking questions about anxiety and depression, and a test of smell. All those things are affected in PSP. And they found that 39% of the healthy relatives of people with PSP had an abnormal score on this composite test, and none of the healthy controls did. And this did reach statistical significance. Remember I said it has to be less than 0.05? Well, it was less than 0.001. And this just shows the reaction time. This is that movement test, that component. This shows the reaction times for the, uh, the, the white bars are the uh, shorter reaction times. In other words, faster reactions for the controls compared with the PSP people. All right, um, now we're going to 
talk a little bit about the treatment, and then we'll get back a little bit to some, maybe some scientific things, if we have time. All right. Um, they say that PSP and CBD are untreatable. Not true. There's plenty of things we can do. Carbidopa levodopa, this was one of the major medical advances of the 20th century for Parkinson's disease. And it doesn't work all that well in PSP, but it's worth trying for those people with PSP who have some Parkinsonism. And what do I mean by Parkinsonism? I mean slowness and stiffness. Not everybody with PSP has that. And those are the symptoms that might respond to carbidopa levodopa. Now, what is this stuff anyway? Well, levodopa gets turned into dopamine in the brain. Dopamine is one of the important uh, chemicals in the brain that the brain cells use to communicate with other brain cells. And uh, the problem is that if you just give levodopa by itself, everybody just throws up. It's awful. Carbidopa prevents that. The carbidopa by itself has no benefit on anything else except preventing the nausea from levodopa. And the dosages that you need in PSP are much higher than for Parkinson's disease. So it works mainly in PSP Parkinsonism, that subtype, as you would guess from what I've said before about PSP Parkinsonism, as opposed to PSP Richardson's. It helps only the stiffness and the slowness. It doesn't work for as long as it does in Parkinson's, where it, it'll, work, it'll work for the life of the patient with, uh, in Parkinson's, but it works only for about a year usually in PSP. There are exceptions. Helps only modestly at best. And the main side effect would be hallucinations, as in Parkinson's, but that's easy enough to control, either by cu cutting back on the dose or by adding an anti-hallucination drug. Uh, and unlike in Parkinson's, it rarely causes dyskinesias. You've seen uh, Michael J. Fox with his movements. That's caused by his levodopa. That's not part of Parkinson's. Uh, in PSP, even though the dosages of levodopa are higher than Parkinson's, those abnormal movements basically don't occur. So it's easier to pump up the dose level. So I use levodopa for the people who have Parkinsonism. Amantadine, I try in everybody with PSP as well. Now what is amantadine? This is, a, this is a Parkinson drug that came on the market about the same time as levodopa back in the 1960s. It's that old. And it, um, the benefit in PSP is based only on retrospective evidence. In other words, it wasn't a controlled trial where you allocate half the people to get a dummy pill and half the people to get amantadine. No, it was based on looking back through my records and my former boss's records uh, of people with PSP who had been given amantadine and had been given other Parkinson drugs and other types of drugs and see what they responded to. And so it was kind of a controlled trial in which we had all these other drugs as controls. And the amantadine worked, the, worked just as well as levodopa, not in the same patients at the same time, but in just as well as levodopa. It mainly seems to help gait freezing, but it also seems to help the apathy. Uh, and a lot of people will, will report that their, their vision improves. And I don't think it's because it actually improves their ability to move their eyes. I think it's because it improves the apathy. Very often in PSP, the person's not looking at something because it's, it's like they're not interested. A caregiver will say, no, they're not really interested. And that's true. There, it's, a, it's a formal psychiatric symptom called apathy. And so they're not looking at what they're supposed to be looking at, and it's interpreted as poor vision. Uh, same thing with walking. If you pay more attention to the task of walking, you'll do better, even though your motor control is actually no different. Same thing with speech. If you pay more attention to whether somebody can hear you the way a healthy person does all the time, you pay attention to whether what's coming out of your mouth is clear like a healthy person does all the time without having to think about it. Someone with PSP is apathetic to that. Amantadine may help that. Possible side effects of amantadine? Confusion. It's, uh, amantadine has um, 
you've heard of uh, belladonna, which back in the 1800s was, that was used for, for Parkinson's. It caused confusion, which is why it's not used anymore. Um, that can happen. And dry mouth, constipation, swelling of the legs, none of these things are, uh, are that big a problem. They can always be dealt with in some way. Don't forget about the swelling of the legs. People on amantadine, they don't, may not realize that they can get swelling of the legs from the amantadine, and then they go to their primary care doctor who works up their, their heart, their lungs, their kidneys, all kinds of things, looking for their blood vessels, their lymphatic system, looking for causes of swelling of the legs. But it's just the amantadine. Coenzyme Q10. This, unlike all those, unlike the other two diseases, this, this drug has actually been subjected to case control, to uh, double blind trials, controlled trials. And the, um, I won't get into the, all the details of how it works. Suffice it to say, it's a, new, it's a normal substance in the brain that helps the brain produce energy from sugar and oxygen, works in the mitochondria. It's available over the counter. It's about $80 a month. Doesn't, it doesn't get paid by insurance because it's over the counter. It may take two months to work. If it fails to help in that time, forget about it. This shows the, the data on the, the benefit of coenzyme Q10 compared to placebo. And this is a second study which almost reached statistical significance. It was a very small study. Uh, there were a lot of dropouts from the study for reasons unrelated to the drug. If those patients had stayed in, it probably would have reached statistical significance. And this is the same study. A few words about MSA. MSA, remember I said that was an alpha-synuclein disease. Not important to you, but it's a very different disease from PSP. It's not just a variant of the same thing like the PSP Parkinsonism is. There are three main symptoms of MSA. Parkinsonism, meaning the slowness and the stiffness. Cerebellar, meaning a loss of coordination in a drunken type way. And autonomic, which means low blood pressure, constipation, bladder problems. And each person with MSA has some combination of these three things. The autonomic features, uh, what I, whoops. What I mentioned, low blood pressure, especially on a rising, it can actually cause fainting, constipation, urinary frequency, incontinence, urinary retention, ejaculatory or more commonly erectile dysfunction. Men won't admit to this of their own accord. They have to be asked about it. Uh, it's usually their wives who will uh, report it to me spontaneously. Uh, temperature intolerance, sweating deficiency, dry skin, and light sensitivity because of pure, poor function of the pupil. And so those patients may want to wear sunglasses. In PSP, people want to wear sunglasses too, but for a different reason. It's because in PSP, there's so little bl spontaneous blinking of the eyes. It's much, much reduced blinking. And it allows the surface of the eye to dry out, which causes irritation of the surface of the eye. And when you have irritation, you get inflammation. Then the inflammation makes you want, it creates an irritated feeling that just makes you tear and want to blink a lot. And so that's why a lot of people with PSP want to use sunglasses. And sometimes they even will close their eyes spontaneously to keep the light out because the light aggravates the, the irritation. Other things in multiple system atrophy. There's dystonias, which is like a sustained weird posture of the hand. Sometimes it can be a forced smile. Sometimes it can be where the chin is down on the chest. Sometimes it can be a tilting of the trunk to the side. That's called the Pisa syndrome. I won't go through all these in too much detail. A jerkiness to the movement. A strange kind of speech problem. It kind of tends to sound like this. Uh, breathing control, noisy breathing, <clears throat> that kind of thing. It's very frightening to the family. Uh, problem with circulation in the hands and feet, kind of a blue-purple tinge. Uh, 
Cognitive and behavioral problems, not as important as in PSP, but they can still happen. And sleep problems, including sleep apnea and the REM behavioral disorder, the rapid eye movement behavioral disorder where someone acts out their dreams, sometimes in a very violent fashion that can injure their bed partner. And this is very easily treated. And if you have that symptom, very common symptom, happens in Parkinson's as well, you should report that to the doctor because it's very easily treated. It, it has to be the bed partner who reports it because the patient doesn't remember the next morning. So how do we treat MSA? I mentioned how we treat PSP. It's a lot more complicated with MSA because it, there's a lot more things to treat. There's a, the, my patients with MSA, I'm constantly, I mean, the, a half hour is not nearly enough in a revisit to talk about all the different treatments going on for their various symptoms. There's treatments of levodopa for the Parkinsonian part. Keep in mind that can aggravate low blood pressure, and they already have low blood pressure. You can treat the ataxia, the, the incoordination with physical therapy. You can treat the bladder problems as you would for bladder problems of any kind with medications. Sometimes a prostate operation will help. Um, with a constipation, sorry, this is, should have been its own category. Standard treatments of constipation. Here's how you treat the low blood pressure. You raise the blood pressure, not that difficult to do with medications and non-medication measures. You can treat the depression with antidepressants or non-drug therapy. You can treat the dementia with drugs designed for Alzheimer's disease. You can treat the sleep problem with sleeping pills or sleep hygiene, non-drug measures. Exercise helps the sleep. The REM behavioral disorder I mentioned, not only clonazepam, but also melatonin can help that. The obstructive sleep apnea can be treated with CPAP or other measures that, depending, in an extreme case, it may require a tracheotomy. The dystonia can be treated uh, with Botox injections. Myoclonus, which is jerky movements, can be treated with various medications. And the erectile dysfunctions, if you watch TV, you know how that's treated. The restless leg syndrome is uh, part of MSA, as it is of Parkinson's. There are certainly drugs for that, again, advertised on TV. Hallucinations are treated with psychiatric medications. There are only these two that don't aggravate the Parkinsonism, so you have to be very careful about that. And daytime sleepiness can be treated with drugs that keep you awake that are used for things like narcolepsy or for people who, are on, uh, who have to work night shifts. That is all my material. I guess we'll have questions and answers later. OK, thank you very much. Right now. OK. Maybe bring the microphone up. Right, right here, this gentleman right here. Um, if a person is taking the amantadine, how, and you said to stop after six to eight weeks if there's no uh, help, how that, can you tell was, if it's helping? Uh, that was the coenzyme Q10. I'm sorry, yes. Uh, still a good question. How do you tell if it's helping? <clears throat> uh, two ways. One is that the patient and family will have a pretty good idea of the baseline before you started the drug, and then they can assess at a month and at two months just at home how the person's doing in their daily activities. And if there's not a perceptible improvement, then the drug's not worth taking. If it, if the, if it requires the doctor to tap on the knees or something to see the improvement, then that's not of any material benefit for the patient. Now, you can't stop a mantadine cold turkey. It has to be tapered down under the doctor's supervision. And uh, there is a, a rating scale in, Dave's in, in uh, Bill's introduction. He said that I invented the PSP rating scale. That is very useful for assessing before and after. Uh, not too many doctors know how to do it, though. Um, recently, um, my husband's neurologist has um, given him a prescription for Ritalin to help with the, um, the excessive fatigue as he's still functional and wants to participate in a lot of the things that he enjoys doing. Um, and it is helping him. What's your take on that? I have no, I have no objections. It's, uh, you know, Ritalin can cause uh, rapid heartbeat. Uh, but in 
used cautiously, started at low amounts, built up gradually. That can, that can certainly work. The, the drugs that I mentioned for daytime sleepiness, the modafinil, uh, that, that can have the same side effects. Those are all amphetamine type drugs. Yes. Okay, let's go back there until she can bring your microphone here. Okay, I have a, a couple of questions. Oh. Go ahead. Yeah, a couple of questions. Uh, for the carbon, uh, uh, L-DOPA treatment for MSA, uh, you described what, what you would expect for a PSP. For MSA, uh, is it still a, an approximately year effect, or, is it, or are there enough studies to, to say something about that? It, it does work better for, a little better for MSA than for PSP. Not much better, though. Okay. So then my other two questions are a little bit more scientific and data-based. Uh, <clears throat> you have such small numbers for M MSA, and there's such a diversity of, of um, symptoms. It seems to me it's very hard to come to any broad conclusions for that, for that, for that disease or that, that broad disease. Is that, is that true? And then I, how, do, how do we get any conclusions for this? Uh, yeah, there is, a, there is a literature comparing the various types of MSA. There's really, it's usually broken down into two types. There's the, the MSA Parkinsonism and the MSA cerebellar. Uh, and so comparing those two, there is some literature on that. It gets compared in various ways. I didn't want to get into all okay. that in this But talk. the numbers are really very small, so it's hard to draw broad conclusions. Yeah, but there, there still is a literature there, and there's, there's an MSA coalition which does the same work that Cure PSP does, and, and there's grants for MSA, yeah. Okay, and then for co Coenzyme Q, is that helpful for MSA as well? Is that what's the it's view never, on it? It's never been adequately tested in MSA, as far as I know. Okay, one last thing, and that, and that is, you showed some studies that go back to, I think, 2005, they're published in 2005 on life expectancy, but those would be based on data you know, much earlier and here we are 20 years later, do we have, and, and I, I would guess that the diagnosis would be coming earlier than previously. So do we have to revise our thinking about sort of life expectancy and anticipation of the progress of the disease? Uh, I, I wish that were true. Uh, you, you assume that the diagnosis comes earlier. To me, that is not obvious. And therefore, I had a, <coughs> excuse me, a resident actually look in my records going back to the 1980s, each decade compared to look whether the diagnosis is being made earlier in the course of the disease now than it was back then. And sure enough, it was. It was, it was close to four years then between the initial symptom and initial diagnosis, and now it's a little over two and a half years. Nevertheless, and, and I said, well, maybe this, is, this has to do with a change in the life expectancy. So she, I told her to look, go back and look and see if there is a change, and no, there was not a change. Okay. Thank Good you. question. Yeah. Um, what's the root cause of tau protein? Is that anything to do with the diet, or uh, there is no? You, <clears throat> you've asked the question that's in the, the slides that I, I hid. You know how in PowerPoint you can hide slides? <laughs> because I didn't think I'd have time for that. Okay. Uh, I did not have time for it. Uh, but the answer to the question of what, what's actually causing the tau protein to misbehave? The theories are that it's some combination of a subtle toxic exposure, over, maybe over a period of years, maybe multiple toxins working in tandem, maybe a metal as one of those toxins or multiple of those toxins, metals, because we do know of one cluster of PSP in the world, one geographical cluster. It's in northern France, and there are 13 times the number of people with PSP in these two little towns adjacent towns in northern France where there's a lot of metals contamination of the environment from factories that were there. So maybe metals, there's an association with well water use. We don't know what it is in the well water. Um, a lady asked me this morning, could it be septic tank use? And I said, well, that's no, to my knowledge, that's never been associated with PSP, but it may be the same people who use wells who also use septic tanks. They live in the country. Right. So maybe, I don't know. Uh, that's a good question worth examining. Okay, so it's some environmental thing, and there's subtle genetic stuff. A multiple, maybe half a dozen genes, each of which contribute a very subtle amount. 
so subtle that we, you saw the family history data that I showed, so subtle that it doesn't show up when you look in families for second cases of PSP. Right. Yeah. Any other questions? I just have one more to ask. Okay. Do you, uh, what do you, rec do you recommend? I mean, what's your input about La louder. stem cell? My, my opinion yeah. about stem cell treatment. Yeah. Stem cells. Uh, well, my opinion about stem cell treatment is do not go to China for stem cell treatment. No. That's, that's a scam. Yeah. Uh, there have been some legitimate attempts to use stem cells for replacement therapy. Replacement therapy means getting the stem cells into the brain and allowing them to take root, grow there, form complicated connections. You know, don't forget the original connections were formed when we were a millimeter long uh, you know, as an embryo, and, and you can't recreate those connections in the adult brain. And so, but it, people have tried, and it has failed. But where stem cells may prove useful is in drug delivery, where you can program the stem cells to be compatible with the person's brain so they won't get rejected, and they can be programmed to produce a drug. So if one of these drugs that's being tested right now can be produced by stem cells, and you can put the stem cells into the brain, then you don't have to go every month for an IV infusion.